Well, good morning. Thank you, uh, Dr. DiNapoli, for that very kind introduction. And uh, it's great to be back here in Cincinnati. I, I was here, I think, giving grand rounds uh, back in 2015. Um, I also want to make a, make a few words about Jeff. Um, I think I met Jeff maybe like 2013 or 14 when I was invited to Khaled Aziz's course. And I think we began a, a very nice friendship from that point going forward. And we've been together in many numerous skull-based courses around the world. And these are some pictures actually from France where we had done Sebastian's course. And, um, uh, you know, Jeff is, I, I think is one of the kindest people in neurosurgery. He's a wonderful human being. And he's made numerous contributions academically that have shaped my knowledge but also shaped my thinking and uh, development as a neurosurgeon. And, um, and I'm just grateful for my, my friendship with Jeff. And it is an honor to, to be giving this lecture in your name. So thank you for, for inviting me. What I wanted to talk about today is just a little bit more of a philosophical talk on sort of how I think about skull base surgery and, uh, and, and de tackling very difficult problems. And, and so I wanted to highlight uh, several pathologies and and talk about you know this concept of of walking the line between functionality and radicality. So these are a, a variety of different lateral skull based lesions. You could see this is a this is an epidermoid, uh, a schwannoma, meningiomas, acoustic and trigeminal schwannomas, and and so forth. And there's a lot of avenues to get there, and many have described over the decades. On, on the different skull base approaches laterally. And of course the workhorse is the retrosigmoid and, and most people would, would be proponents that this would be the easiest route and the simplest without having to do a lot of temporal bone drilling. And I think we've, in, when we, when we uh, dawned upon the era of skull base surgery, there was this uh, notion of you know, getting the best MRI scan and doing a radical resection, curative removal for the patient. But sometimes it would be at the cost of function of injuring cranial nerve function, having worsening facial nerve or, or lower cranial nerve dysfunction. And so how do we, the, the pendulum has certainly swung in some sense where, um, you know, in, in recent decades, we, we really thought about quality of life and optimizing the function for the patient. So how can we achieve both? How can we do a, an excellent you know, tumor resection without leaving too much behind and then achieving optimal cranial nerve function? And I'm, I'm gonna highlight several pathologies that, would, that will highlight this uh, concept and highlight some uh, technical nuances on, on how we can do that in a, on a practical basis. So let's talk about acoustic neuromas. As you know, the, the goal of most acoustic neuromas, especially the large ones, CUS grade three and fours, are we want to achieve a gross total resection as possible, but we also want to preserve patient's facial nerve. And in, in recent years, there's been this uh, increased interest in this concept of the adaptive hybrid surgery, which is a planned subtotal followed by gamma knife radio surgery. And this is one of the early papers highlighting this concept, showing this pre and post-op scan. And this has led to some criticism and, and something that we're seeing in our community as well is that we're seeing an increased number of non-specialists and, and uh, non-specialty centers doing this type of approach. And I think we have to ask ourselves, is this the right, right thing for the patient? And so here's an example. This is a, a patient with this uh, large tumor, 40 year old, and uh, had someone uh, do the surgery you can see this is actually the post-op scan. It really looks the same as the pre-op scan, but they told the family, we got most of it, the rest is inoperable and we can shrink it with radiation. So the patient got radiation and was on a medicine floor afterwards uh, spas with spastic quadriparesis and, and nonverbal and non-ambulatory. Fortunately, she was transferred to our center and um, we found another route. Instead of going the retrosigmoid, we did a trans lab and uh, due to the tumor adherence to the facial nerve, we, we left a rind of tumor along the course of the facial nerve. And uh, this was the immediate post-op. And uh, this is nine years post-op now. 
And so she's done quite, quite well and she improved markedly. She uh, got her ability to walk again. You can see she's lost some hair from the radiation treatment. And then here she is at six months. And then uh, I saw her recently. She's I think 10 or 11 years post-op now, but uh, she's maintained a rather uh, normal quality of life. And so uh, she had a very excellent outcome. So I think when we look at the uh, literature about this hybrid technique, we have to examine it very carefully. So if you look at this uh, systematic review, you'll see that the studies that have been highlighted, the planned subtotal debulking is primarily intracapsular, meaning you don't come around the uh, periphery of the tumor. The, um, the results look quite good though. Look, facial nerve preservation, Brackman 1 and 2 is 96%, and serviceable hearing is about roughly 60%. And so the preliminary results appear quite favorable. But again, I think we have to ask ourselves, is this, are we doing the right thing for the patient? And, and some of my own criticisms are, you know, when the subtotal is already pre-planned, you have this attitude of, I'm really not really gonna try to remove the tumor. And since the tumor debulking is primarily intracapsular and you don't come around this outside of the tumor, it's really difficult to assess how much volume reduction you've done. And even with uh, a stealth navigation, you end up underestimating what the residual is. And, and there is a huge spectrum of different residuals. Um, we're lacking long-term follow-up, so we don't know what's gonna happen in the next decade or so. And we don't know if we're treating, uh, we'll be treating a new emerging disease. But um, also we're forgetting how to do, you know, good, safe microneurosurgery, dissecting facial nerves safely and effectively. So it's becoming a lost art. And I think also as educators, uh, how are we gonna teach the next generation of our trainees on how to do these difficult complex surgeries if the teachers themselves aren't doing it anymore? So, and we won't be able to tackle other CP angle lesions uh, at, at, such as these chordomas or paragangliomas. So I think just like aneurysm microsurgery, uh, you know, facial nerve dissection surgery is becoming a lost art. So I wanted to mention also that not subtotals, not all subtotals are created equal. And, and this is my, my rough classification system. This is the chunk, which is less than 95. This is the little carpet. And then this is the linearly, uh, barely visible uh, minimal enhancement. And if you look at the literature, uh, you can see that the volume of residual correlates with the rate of tumor occurrence. So in, in a sense, extent of resection does matter. So uh, how, can we, how can we apply these uh, concepts to ma achieving maximal tumor removal and still achieve the best facial nerve outcome? So my own personal strategy and philosophy is that when you're going in, you, you should have the philosophy of the intent of getting a gross total if safely possible. But if you have to leave a residual, that decision should be made intraoperatively based on intraoperative observations and judgment. And so if you do decide to leave some tumor behind, we should try to leave the least amount of residual possible while still preserving the facial nerve. So that in effect, we're achieving a radical near total or a radical subtotal. And, and the illustration I like to highlight is this uh, illustration uh, on a paper by Sasaki. You can see how the tumor, as it grows, the vestibular nerves on the periphery are stretched. And there's a layer of fiber called the perineurium that is on stretch around the periphery of the tumor. And this layer actually serves as a layer of protection of the facial and cochlear nerves. So here's an intraoperative. Um, picture showing that perineurium, and it has this clear membrane that looks like arachnoid. And I think a lot of people, when they say, when they talk about acoustic surgery, they always talk about, well, maintaining that arachnoid plane. And I think they're referring to this, and it's histologically, it's not arachnoid, it's actually, it's actually perineurium. So if you maintain this layer, you'll, in essence, instead of dissecting in the subarachnoid space, you stay in this plane and, and you peel it like an onion. So I call it like an onion peeling technique where you leave that layer 
And that layer serves as a buffer of protection for the facial nerve. So I'll illustrate this in this video that we published some years ago. This is a large cystic uh, acoustic neuroma. We're doing a retrosigmoid approach. And I always tell the residents when you're de dealing with tumors, you want to undress the tumor. So the tumor has little layers on it. It's got a layer of an arachnoid. And then, it, then you look for the perineurium. So here's the perineurium of the inferior vestibular nerve. And we're just going to use the scissors to spread that layer. And then we're going to start to peel it like an onion. So we're going to keep that layer. And that's the perineurium. And this is the subperineural dissection plane, keeping that subperineural membrane intact. So we start to come around the tumor on the inferior border. And then we can come around the medial side. And you can see we're starting to get it off the brain stem. So I'm not looking at any. Uh, subarachnoid structures. I haven't opened up. There I've opened up a little bit of subarachnoid uh, fluid inadvertently. There's the fifth nerve. But I'm going to find my plane and come back, pick up the superior vestibular uh, nerve fibers, and then get that clear membranous subperineural membrane. You see how there's like a veil there? That arachnoid-ish like layer? That's the perineurium covering the seventh nerve. And so now I can come around the medial side. There's the brain stem. Now I'm going to come on the lateral side in the IAC and start peeling away uh, the membrane from the true tumor capsule. And here it usually it's, it's a nice smooth plane. And once you get close to the porous or just beyond the porous, it can get quite adherent here. So you really have to use sharp dissection with scissors. And I use scissors to trim and sort of snip and push and, and get right down on that layer. And if I sense that there is a lot of excessive adhesion there, this is where I have a lower threshold to leave a small residue. So here you can see there's a small little tumor residue there. I can tell you this case, the nerve never went off at all. It was really quiet. I do facial motor evoke potentials as a, as a secondary uh, monitoring technique. And he woke up, this is Brackman 1 in the recovery room, and a near total removal. I left a small residual. So this is, you can also apply this to trans lab. This is a trans lab approach. You can see this is left-sided pre-sigmoid and we're opening up and peeling the arachnoid off of the tumor. Again, we're undressing the tumor, peeling that arachnoid off. And then we're working around the medial side of the brain stem. And then once we get to the brain stem, we'll use a, a fine micro bayonet scissors. Any areas of adhesions, you sharp to section to really detach the tumor so you don't pull or yank on the brain stem. And then gently spread and find that plane. And then what we'll do is we'll, we'll pick up that perineural layer here. And the beauty of the trans lab is that you can identify the facial nerve laterally. So here's the facial nerve. And then We'll start to peel this uh, tumor capsule, leaving a thin layer of the perineurium over the facial nerve. So here's the facial nerve going in to the distal IAC. There's Bill's bar. This is the fallopian mastoid branch. And then we'll use a disc dissector to do what I call a push away technique where you stay right on the tumor capsule. You ride the tumor capsule and the flat part of the instrument will push away the perineural membrane layer. And then here's a McElveen hook to uh, detach more tumor adhesions. And then gentle spreading and cutting, cutting any adherent fibers. It's also important to debulk the tumor. Uh, debulking the tumor collapses it and it makes the tumor more manageable. So as you progressively debulk it, you can collapse it, come around it. It really makes it a lot more manageable. And so here's the point of adhesion. You can see it's really attached to the perineal membrane <clears throat> and any kind of stretch causes the EMG to fire. So here we're gonna trim. And this is how you leave the least amount of residual behind. So instead of leaving this big chunk, if I just sharply detach it, there's just a thin little carpet or residue that's attached right on that membrane. And then we'll release the, uh, the remainder of it to get the tumor out. Now, 
a little bit of bleeding. Um, I advise not to use any cautery because uh, you use cautery, you can injure the nerve. So a little surgicel, gentle packing, and a little bit of weighting and, and irrigation will stop the bleeding and avoid any thermal injury to the nerve. In terms of repair, um, I like using this technique. This is a technique we published some years ago, using a fasciolata to create a, a sling or a hammock to hold the fat graft so that the fat graft isn't uh, touching the brainstem. Usually the traditional approach is the otologist will put the fat graft to plug the hole, but the post-op scan, you end up seeing this finger of fat that's always tickling the brainstem. So I like using this technique, which has been effective for us. So here's a, a, a variety of different uh, acoustics, some near total, some gross total, House Brackman one uh, results. Here's some, again, a series of large tumors. These were all near totals and uh, uh, Brackman one and two results. And, and what we're seeing is that uh, there's more Brackman one and two immediate post-op in the recovery room and, and hospital course but if they do have some facial weakness, we're seeing faster recovery as early as six weeks on some of the patients. So I think what that membrane layer does is it does act as a layer of a buffer of protection so that you're not directly dissecting on the nerve and potentially devascularizing it or injuring it. Uh, here's an example of a Brackman 3. This was a, a larger tumor in my earlier series. Um, you can see he's got uh, uh, symmetry at rest, but but gross asymmetry with forced smile. So we've been tracking our, our um, results. We're probably up to 150 now uh, consecutive using this technique, but it's roughly remained about 95% Brackman 1 and 2 and 5% uh, 3 and 4. So other schwannomas we can encounter in the CP angle aren't always vestibular. This is an example of a trigeminal schwannoma. And you can see it's got its classic dumbbell appearance. And this is the tumor extending into Meckel's cave. And so we have to always be prepared not to use the uh, retrosigmoid approach or the traditional CP angle approach. But one of the approaches I think that is very effective is the anterior patrosal or Kawasi's approach. And I know Kawasi had spent some time here in Cincinnati and uh, was also a, a previous recipient uh, of the lecture. And, and this is one of my favorite approaches. And I, I think this approach is not well understood by a lot of centers around the country. It's um, a bit foreign, I think, to a, a, lot, of, a lot of centers. And, and I, I don't think it's used enough. But when used appropriately, it's very powerful and very effective technique. And, and I think the main advantage of what the Kawasi approach does, uh, and this is a beautiful illustration uh, by Tanya and her team here, is that you can see you get a short distance to Meckel's cave. So if I see a tumor that's in Meckel's cave uh, and there's CP angle component, the Kawasi's approach gives you this beautiful view of the, of the CP angle and it gets you right into Meckel's cave very safely. The alternative approach, if you did retrosigmoid, is you have to do the RISA approach, which is the retrosigmoid intradural supramedial tubercle drilling to get into Meckel's cave but it's a long reach and um, you don't really get good, you don't have a lot of space or room to dissect the tumor off of the trigeminal fibers. Whereas this approach, I'll show you, gets you a beautiful view. This is the craniotomy, a frontotemporal craniotomy. And the key landmark here is the middle fossa rhomboid. It's uh, bordered by V3, GSPN, arcuate eminence, and the medial petrous ridge drop the, the the bisection line, this is the IAC, and the anterior medial is the cochlea. So you have to preserve these structures. And as long as you know this uh, rhomboid landmark, you can avoid these structures. So we'll cut the middle fossa dura, open up the tentorium to the free edge, and then we'll open up the fibrous ring of the porous trigeminus. So here is the root of the trigeminal going, we've opened up the fibrous ring, so we've communicated the root of the fifth nerve into the Gasserian ganglion. And the other beauty of this approach is that it allows you to land in front of the cranial nerves. It allows you to land in front of five, and here is seven and eight. So you see how we're, we're not working past seven and eight from a retrosigmoid. We're working right in front of it from a Kawasi's approach. So seven and eight are out of your way coming from this projection. 
And the idea of trigeminal schwannoma surgery is you have to preserve as many uh, fascicles as possible to avoid any facial dysesthesia. And so with sharp dissection, uh, you can see we're going to preserve the main trunk here and then find where the vestibular attachments are. But you can see we have great access right into Meckel's cave. We were able to just deliver it from Meckel's cave. And then here's the trunk, the trigeminal trunk preserved. You can go right, in, right into Meckel's cave. And there's Porsche Minor. And so here's the pre-op and here's the post-op scan. So again, uh, a nice removal here. He had a very uh, mild to moderate facial numbness, which has been tolerable over the years. Uh, I want to talk briefly about uh, skull-based meningiomas. They're, uh, there's, they can occur anywhere in the skull base. And I think we've described most of the workhorse approaches to all of these locations. But I think one of the more difficult ones uh, that continues to be the most formidable is the petroclival meningioma. And these are very rare. You can see it's less than 1% of all intracranial tumors. But they're formidable because of its deep location, but also because they can often uh, invade or be adherent to the brainstem, be involved with the basilar perforators, and, and very uh, involved with cranial nerves. So uh, aggressive removal of these has led to a lot of morbidity. And I think we have to distinguish petroclival, true petroclival, from this tumor, which I think some uh, would call petroclival, but it's really not. This is more of a, a posterior petrus or petrotentorial meningioma. And what defines this as opposed to a true petroclival is that the true petroclivals originate medial to the fifth nerve, are limited to the upper two thirds of the clivus, uh, and um, often will involve in Meckel's cave or invade the cavernous sinus and, and also encompass a, a supratentorial as well as an infratentorial component. But the main thing is that the nerves, the cranial nerves in a true petroclival are often on the dorsal aspect of the tumor, whereas the other tumor I showed you with the complete removal, the nerves are on the ventral side. So if the nerves are in between the surgeon and the tumor, you're working through small corridors between the nerves and it makes it very difficult and you can often injure the nerves that way. So here's an example of a, of a large tumor. We did a combined patrosal approach. And so this approach is one that entails uh, removing the temporal bone, the uh, subtemporal craniotomy with a retrosigmoid craniotomy and a mastoidectomy. And there's different degrees of mastoidectomies you can perform based on the hearing status. So here the hearing status is intact. So we'll do a retro lab and then we'll do an anterior petrosectomy. So a combined is combining an anterior with a posterior petrosectomy and it gives you this multi-angled attack. So you have more than one avenues to, to attack the tumor. It's what Al -Mefti, Professor Al Mefti calls a, a double patrosal or double martini approach where you can come in this way through a Kawasi or this way through a retro lab. And then this was the, uh, the post-op scan we achieved and she had a, a great uh, a clinical outcome. So the different degrees of retro, uh, petrosectomies include the following. If the hearing is intact, you preserve the otic capsule. And one variant of uh, a hearing preservation is if you drill off the superior and posterior canal and you wax off the ampulated ends. The ampulated ends are, are the, um, if you were to, my otology, otology colleague, uh, Bob Jung taught me this. Uh, if you put your arms like this, uh, the, the fists are your ampulated ends. And one arm is the posterior canal, the other arm is the superior canal. And so as you're drilling the canal, you wax off the ampulated ends and you prevent loss of uh, endolymph, you can potentially preserve hearing. But this adds additional exposure, so these uh, semicircular canals are not in your way. And then if your hearing is, is lost, you can use a trans lab. And the approach that we don't use as often now is transcochlear, where you decompress the facial nerve and you mobilize it medially, and it gives you total access to the cochlea, and, and, and you can do a total petrosectomy. We don't use that approach as much anymore since that invariably results in facial nerve uh, injury, and they recover to as good as a Brachman III. So in a tumor like this, this is a petroclival meningioma. You can see it, it's extending into Meckel's cave. These are the following surgical approaches that were considered. 
So if you think about doing this retro sig, look at the degree of retraction you would have to do to get to the medial side. So probably not very optimal. You can now consider more advanced approaches like a posterior patrolsal, an anterior patrolsal, or maybe both, a combined patrolsal. But in this case, we're going to use a transcrucial variant to this to get additional exposure. So we published this uh, technique uh, recently showing this um, combined anterior patrolsal transcrucial technique. So we'll start with a retro lab mastoidectomy. You can see there's the otic capsule, the endolymphatic sac, and that's Troutman's triangle. We'll then elevate the temporal lobe dura, ligate the middle meningeal artery at the foramen spinosum. And that's important to do because then it allows you to elevate the temporal lobe broadly with actually less retractive forces because you're unt untethering the temporal lobe. You want to find the GSPN and dissect it from posterior to anterior. There is the middle fossa rhomboid. So we'll start drilling and doing our anterior petrosectomy. We drill from medial to lateral, looking for the funnel of the IAC dura. And then after we complete our anterior petrosectomy, you can see now we're going to do our transcrucial approach. And as we drill the, uh, amp the semicircular canals, we're going to wax off the ampulated ends. We do it under continuous irrigation, almost underwater, so you don't lose the endolymph or endolymph pressure. And as we wax it off, we'll continue the drilling. But you can see Taking off these semicircular canals gives you that additional few millimeters of exposure. And you'll see that um, it gets you this huge window with no further obstruction to get to this area. And so in this case, we staged it. We, uh, we closed and we came back the next day for the stage two just to divide the length of the surgery out. And so we'll go ahead and do our traditional patrolsal dural opening, which is subtemporal pre-sigmoid, and we ligate the superior patrolsal sinus. But beware of the vein or veins of LeBay. You can see the vein of LeBay is tethered here. And so in order to preserve this, we'll make the dural incision around it and then just elevate the LeBay uh, vein with the temporal lobe. We'll ligate the superior patrolsal sinus and then coagulate the, uh, the sinus and cut the, the dura of the tentorium towards the free edge. And as you're cutting the free edge, you have to be watchful of the fourth nerve, which will be on the medial side. So here are the lower cranial nerves. Fortunately, this tumor, you can see it's all above the seventh and eighth nerve complex. We'll start by debulking the tumor. And as we, as we peel the tumor off the brainstem, we'll start to see the root of the fifth nerve. You can see here's the flattened root of the fifth nerve right on the brainstem. And then we could follow the fifth nerve uh, all the way into Meckel's cave. So there is the basilar artery. And the, the structures on the medial side are always last and most difficult to see. So I would say the sixth nerve and basilar artery are, are, are um, challenging to locate. And so we've opened up the, the ring into the Meckel's cave. And th there's the tumor coming out of Meckel's cave. You can see it's very soft and, and malleable. And so we have great access into Meckel's cave. And then we'll go ahead and come around the top part of the tumor and then try to find the trochlear nerve now. So as we bring the tumor down, you can see it's attached to a lot of arachnoid adhesions. So in order to mobilize this, you want to cut the arachnoid that's right on the tumor capsule. And by cutting that arachnoid, it'll release the tumor and you leave the arachnoid on the side of the cranial nerve. So there's cranial nerve four. And then we'll continue to skeletonize it uh, to its uh, entrance. And then we'll be able to preserve uh, cranial nerve four here. Here's further debulking of the tumor. And just for the interest of time, I'll advance the video here. So here's the last portion of the tumor using a single blade technique to lyse the sharp adhesions here and then finally delivering uh, the tumor. And so um, 
I often like to use the endoscope uh, in a lot of these open approaches. The endoscope's a great tool for endoscopic inspection. It's easy to look around corners to make sure you don't have any hidden areas of tumor. You can see the cranial nerves here. And here's a great view of uh, fifth nerve going into Meckel's cave. And you can see the sixth nerve there at the depth and uh, a view of Meckel's cave there. In terms of the repair, uh, the repair technique here, we're doing the fascia lata sling where we suture the fascia lata in place and then we'll put the, uh, the fat graft uh, on top. So here's the post-op scan. This is a radical near total removal. Uh, we were able to preserve the facial nerve and the hearing with this transcrucial variant. So I think um, in that case, you can get a, a nice near total removal. These ones are more challenging. You could see this has some cobblestoning and invasion of the brainstem surface. So you have to be able to recognize this. And if you do recognize it, you do have to leave a thin rim of tumor on the brainstem. Otherwise you'll, you'll injure the brainstem and get basilar perforator strokes. Um, we leave residual here in the cavernous sinus as well. And so I think the challenge is kind of knowing when to stop in these tumors, but at the same time, we want to maximize the reduction so we make our radiosurgery target as small as, as smallest as possible. You can see the trend, even with the uh, large series by the giants in petroclival surgery, uh, is, ha has trended towards being more conservative, doing a near total rather than a gross total. This is a paper by Dr. Shekhar about doing judicious tumor removal. And then even from Professor Almefti that, uh, you know, sometimes we have to leave some residual tumor for, for safety reasons. So the pendulum, I think, has swung from being radical to more conservative, which I think is, again, um, we want to think about optimizing the quality of life for our patients. So speaking of cavernous sinus, uh, th this is a, 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 what Dwight Parkinson had described as the Extra, extradural anatomical jewel box. And uh, you can see here's an illustration showing why the camera sinus is so important. You see a lot of important cranial nerves here from, you know, three, four, uh, six, five, and five, one, and five, two. And um, one of the, the, the nice developments of, of the anatomy on the anatomy side is that how to expose the cavernous or unlock or expose the cavernous sinus. And, and Dr. Keller has been very instrumental in, in helping us describe uh, how to do that. And, and the key landmark here is really this meningo orbital band and cutting the meningo orbital band and then releasing that so we can peel the dura propria or the dura of the temporal lobe to expose uh, the cavernous sinus. And, and this becomes important when we're dealing with uh, sphenoid wing meningiomas because these often will invade the cavernous sinus and so how do we manage a challenging tumor like this? Yeah. So in this case, you know, we, our goal here is we want to be able to remove everything that's extra cavernous. And my philosophy uh, is that we don't really chase things into the cavernous sinus unless it lends itself. Um, but for meningiomas, they tend to be more invasive, more adherent to the cranial nerves. And so I'll often will leave the intracavernous component alone for radiotherapy. And so in order to do that strategy, you have to understand the layers of the cavernous sinus and the peeling technique to be able to peel away the extradural from the intradural. And, and I love this illustration because you want to be able to communicate your intradural exposure with your extradural. So you do all this extradural drilling. You unroof the optic nerve early to decompress the optic nerve and you wanna uncover the clinoidal segment of the carotid artery because this allows you proximal control of these two structures because on the intradural side, these structures tend to be displaced by these tumors and you can't, in a big tumor like the one I showed you, it's often hard to, to locate them. And um, if you don't have a normal structure to follow and, and, and use as a landmark or reference, you can get lost and, and you can pass point and injure some of these structures with your, your power tools or instruments. So, um, so keep this picture in mind. Another, again, one, another one of Tanya's beautiful drawings that, that has continued to, to be with me uh, on my daily cases. 
So we've taken out the anticholinic process here, open up the dura and split the sylvian fissure. The idea here is we want to find the MCA and the MCA is going to lead us to the ICA. And so you don't want to start debulking this tumor unless you've located the ICA because you debulk the tumor, you can go right through the tumor capsule and hit the artery. So here's the suction is protecting the ICA. So you can debulk and you, you know exactly where the tumor is. But once you've identified the ICA, what we'll do is we'll follow the ICA and just divide the tumor right over it. So this tumor has en encircled the entire carotid artery, but now that we've divided the tumor above it, we can now split the tumor into two zones, a medial zone and a lateral zone. So now what we'll do is we'll go ahead and open up the falciform ligament to decompress the optic nerve. There's the carotid artery. So now we're gonna work on the lateral zone first. So we'll debulk the tumor on the lateral side. I generally find this side to be a little bit uh, easier because there's less cranial nerves uh, and arteries to deal with other than uh, the, uh, the PCOM and choroidal and third nerve. But here we'll, we'll debulk the tumor and we'll, we'll finish off the peeling. This is the Hakuba technique where we're peeling off the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus and then making the dolens cut across the roof of the cavernous sinus and then removing the, the wall. So now we remove the, the lateral wall, which is that dura propria, and we're left with the globular portion intradurally. We're releasing some CSF from the medial tentorial surface. And then we'll come around the backside of the tumor and continue to uh, debulk the tumor sequentially. So here's where you need to be careful. So as you're working on the lateral side of the carotid, since you have the carotid exposed, you can now follow all the different branches. You could follow the PCOM. You must preserve the choroidal as a choroidal stroke is pretty devastating. And the third nerve here was the hardest to find because it was not in its normal anatomical position. It was actually pushed quite medial. And so we're peeling the tumor here off of the SCA. And then here we're using a three hands technique. Look at 12 o'clock. That's where the Kusa or Sonopet, I'm sorry, was um, positioned. And that, my assistant is holding the Sonopet at 12 o'clock. And then that allows me to be hands-free, continuing my two-handed approach. And I can deliver the tumor to the vacuum. So it's just sitting here in the middle and I can deliver the tumor to the suction vacuum of the Sonopet. So now we're working on the medial side. We've taken out the medial side. You have to be wary of the recurrent artery of Huebner, but you can see there's the three hands technique. And then here's the third nerve. There's tumor going right over the third nerve into the posterior cavernous sinus. And then using the three hands technique, we'll go ahead and debulk that last portion without injuring the nerve. So I can kind of protect the nerve while we're delivering the tumor there. So there's the complete uh, end of the resection. Here's a, an extended vascularized pericranial flap that we've elevated for reconstruction. And so what I've done here is I've resected the extra cavernous, but I've left the intracavernous alone. And this was treated with radiotherapy and, and she has had great tumor control for the last eight years or so. Um, I do wanna talk briefly about clinoidectomy. Uh, we have to do this judiciously. It's, uh, it's an important anatomical um, landmark, but, but an, an excellent tool to use but it comes with some risk, but we have to tailor our clinoidectomy to the goal of our surgery. So usually in meningioma surgery, I don't believe you need to uncover the ICA unless you're doing an aneurysm or periclinoid aneurysm. Um, for the goals of meningioma surgery, really you're, you're trying to get rid of any uh, hyperostotic bone and decompressing the optic nerve. But what I'm gonna show you here is that you have to pay attention to all surfaces of the drill. So here I am drilling the optic strut, but look at the red dot. Pay attention to this red dot here. So I, just for a split second, I, I, I probably was not looking at the distal surface of the drill bit. So I was focused on the optic strut. So when you're drilling later today, be mindful of all the surfaces of the drill. It's, it's easy to be focused on one side, but not the bigger picture. So, so keep in mind, where the other surface of the drill are, 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 are shaving. Be mindful of the shaft of your drill as well. 
where it's spinning. So if you're not focused on that, you could catch something and injure something. So I'm going through the progression in my mind now. So the knee jerk reaction is to try to plug everything and not look at it. So that's the mistake. You want to keep your suction in the field so you can inspect what kind of injury it is. And here it's only a small pinhole. I thought about coagulating it, which didn't work. I thought about throwing a suture, which I stopped. I aborted because I knew that that tight space, I'd probably end up tearing the artery, making the hole bigger. But I remembered that in endoscopic surgery, we always talk about using crushed muscle to repair carotid injuries. And so I thought about that. And what I did was I took temporalis, which was already exposed, took a small piece and crushed it, and then really held pressure here for about close to 45 minutes. And uh, the bleeding stopped, fortunately. And um, I was able to go ahead and complete the tumor removal and then take the patient down to angio. And, and you can see, fortunately, there's no pseudoaneurysm here, uh, but you have to do a delayed angio. We did one at one week, four weeks, and three months. And she, fortunately, uh, the artery healed and there was no further pseudoaneurysm. So so be, be mindful of, of your clinidectomy and, and, and uh, drilling. Uh, here's another uh, cranial nerve uh, uh, issue. This was a, a large epidermal, and you can see it wrapped around the brain stem. Uh, what approach do you use for this one? Um, it went all the way down to the lower clivus. So my approach here, I thought, would be a, a retrosigmoid far lateral, and you could see it went all the way into the uh, subtonsillar area. So doing a far lateral was very key in getting this lower part and then getting all the way up to the uh, upper part here. But at the end of the tumor removal, this is what I saw. So I'm irrigating, and then I see this nerve structure, but these strands, and I don't remember cutting anything. And so I kind of had this you know, bad feeling, and I was like, shoot, I must have injured the sixth nerve, and luckily I found the other end. So if you injure the sixth nerve, remember that it can recover if you repair it. So be aggressive in looking for the other end, find the two ends and, and anastomose them together. Some people uh, have advocated just putting fiber and glue on it, but I always worry that the pulsation and waves of CSF are gonna wash the two ends away. So um, I, my preference is to, to put a, a suture and do an anastomosis and you really need just a single suture here. Um, it, it, is, it was a deep hole to try to repair it, but uh, with a little bit of patience, uh, you know, and, tr and being mindful not to bump into the other surrounding nerves, you can, you can get one, one or two knots there just to hold it together. And uh, once you get the two ends together, I, I, I rested the nerve, the anastomosis on the petrous bone, put a little surgis cell and fiber glue in, and held it there together. And uh, here's the endoscopic uh, inspection. And then you could see, uh, this is the blind spot when you come in retrosigmoid. Unless you resect the cerebellum, it's hard to look around this corner. So that's the residual. And then this is four months. Um, you can see her left, she's got a left six nerve palsy. And then here at seven months, it's already made full recovery. So I, I thought this would probably take at least 12 months, but to my surprise, uh, she recovered fully at, at seven months. Unfortunately, at nine months, this residual tumor I showed you started to grow again. And so what do you do now? And this is actually growing faster than I had anticipated. What approach would you do to get to this one? And I thought, well, if I couldn't do it retrosigmoid the first time, I'm probably not going to get it the second time. So how can I look back at this pocket, uh, get a better view of that? And again, I think the, the Kawasi's approach, which I, I mentioned earlier, which is a very effective approach. If you understand what this approach can give you, this is a very effective approach. So we went ahead and did this Kawasi. You can see we drilled out the middle fossa rhomboid. I extended it a little bit to include a little bit of retro lab. And then this is the view I got. So this view that you get from the Kawasi is it allows you to look backwards uh, along the brainstem. And so here's the tumor right along seven and eight. And then we can remove the tumor off of seven and eight. And I also looked for the sixth nerve that I had injured and repaired. There's the sixth nerve. It's actually very healthy now. I think it actually shortened in length. 
and um, and then here's the complete removal. I also want to mention the um, the jugular foramen. This is a, a, a complex anatomy an anatomical area that uh, took me a very long time to understand. Uh, but these tumors here are often uh, quite challenging, uh, mostly paragangliomas, but occasional meningiomas, chordomas, and schwannomas as well. And so this is the approach that that we generally use. This is uh, one that uh, I learned from Dr. Fukushima uh, using this uh, extended lateral approach. And the the idea here is that we want to preserve this medial wall of the jugular bulb. And so if the lower cranial nerves are intact, we want to preserve this medial wall, and we generally don't go beyond it uh, because you'll injure the cranial nerves. And, and Almefti has described this as intrabulbar dissection. You can see this is the, the medial wall that's left behind here uh, to preserve these lower cranial nerves. So here's an example. This is a paraganglioma, a glomus jugulare tumor in a patient that was uh, presented with uh, lower cranial nerve palsies. And you can see on the CTA and then subsequent angiogram, a very hypervascular tumor that was embolized. And we went ahead and did this uh, infratemporal fossa extended lateral approach. It's basically a infralab mastoidectomy. We uh, uh, work with ENT here doing a, um, uh, an extended mastoidectomy fallopian bridge technique. And then we'll ligate the inferior, uh, the internal jugular vein, and then open up the sigmoid sinus, and then plug up the proximal uh, sigmoid sinus with an intraluminal gel foam. And then I'm injecting gel foam actually distally. So it's actually plugging the inferior petrosal sinus back bleeding. But now we have the jugular system isolated, and any back bleeding I continue to control here with some uh, surge flow to pack off the the bleeding, here's some bleeding from the inferior petrosal sinus. And then here's the tumor removal right at the superior pole of the jugular bulb. This is the mastoid segment of the facial nerve. We leave the bone intact over it for protection. This helps avoid a, a facial nerve injury. And so here's the top of the tumor in that jugular bulb and we'll preserve that medial wall uh, of the cavernous sinus. And then we'll go ahead and open up the, the po top portion of the internal jugular vein. And this area uh, took a while for me to understand. There's a muscle here called the rectus capitis lateralis muscle. And, and that extends from C1 to the, uh, the mastoid. And so if you open that, this really allows you exposure of this jugular foramen region. And so now we have control over the, uh, the superior pole of the tumor. You can see there's probably some microinvasion into these small uh, perforating holes into the medial side of that, that bulbar wall. And then we'll open up the internal jugular vein here with a, uh, a 15 blade. And then we can access the tumor that's in the lumen. This is the tumor that's in the lumen of the jugular vein. And we'll continue uh, to deliver the tumor here and, and lift it out of its uh, luminal uh, wall. And uh, there's the uh, paraganglioma. You can see it's purple from embolization. And then we'll preserve all of this medial wall here, all the microinvasion that was on the medial side, but remove all of the extra, extra luminal portion. And so here's the pre-op and then here's the post-op scan. Uh, and she had a stable cranial nerve function and, and a Brackman one. In this case, you see this gentleman, this is a different case. This gentleman has a wing scapula, a hemiatrophy of the tongue and swallowing difficulties. So he has a, a Vernet's type syndrome and um, the wing of the scapula is from spinal accessory nerve palsy. And so his scan showed this uh, chordoma uh, compressing the brainstem. So, at first glance, you might think, wow, this is great for endonasal approach, but uh, further study will show that it's quite a large tumor going into the peripharyngeal space, carotid space here, and it's invading the jugular foramen. It's also eroded the occipital cervical joint, resulting in some neck pain and instability. So the approach here I decided was a, a, a lateral approach, coming in uh, the approach much like a glomus tumor. 
So we'll do a infralab mastoidectomy here um, and decompress the sigmoid sinus. And then this is the tumor that's completely eroded the occipital condyle. And now we're gonna open up the vertebral artery. This is the vertebral foramen. This is the V3 segment. We'll do our fallopian bridge technique, preserving the mastoid segment of the facial nerve. And then here's the tumor in the distal jugular bulb. So now we'll tie off the internal jugular vein, open up the sigmoid sinus, and then occlude the back bleeding from the sigmoid with the intraluminal gel foam and then injecting surgiflow distally to prevent back bleeding from the inferior patrosal sinus. And then we can go ahead and open up the lumen of the jugular bulb. And then there's tumor here right in the jugular bulb. And then we'll start to go after the tumor that's in the carotid space. This is the uh, peripharyngeal space where we've retracted the carotid arteries, debulk the tumor, and then follow it up to the jugular foramen and, and then resect the rest of this jugular vein it's, since it's already occluded. We'll drill off the rest of this remnant of the occipital condyle. It's like a loose tooth. But taking off that condyle then gets you to that C1, C2 space where there's tumor that's circulating around the ring of C1 around the odontoid. And then we can now drill off the inferior clivus. This is the, the lower part of the clivus where the top of the tumor was. And then there's the tip of the odontoid right where my suction is. And I can drill off, shave off the tip of the odontoid. And then we'll go ahead and go intradurally. There's the tumor compressing the brainstem. There's one vertebral artery. And then we'll resect the tumor in front of the vertebral artery. Those are the lower cranial nerves. These are already dysfunctional. So we'll go ahead and divide these in order to get the tumor out. He already has existing uh, palsies. And so we'll resect the anterior wall. There's the VB junction. And then the challenge here is repair. So you have this huge defect. We'll use an alloderm uh, a repair as an inlay. And then we have to occlude the, um, the mastoid antrum, the middle ear, so you don't get CSF leaking into the middle ear. And then we'll use a fat graft and med port to, to hold it in place. And so here is the, uh, the pre-op scan and here's the post-op scan. And then we came back on a delayed fashion to do the stabilization. And uh, he did quite well and, and was referred to uh, radiation therapy after that. So I think lastly, I'll just briefly touch on craniopharyngiomas. Uh, these are, uh, again, very, Cushing called these uh, formidable lesions. And I think we have to take a tailored approach to this. Um, I think endoscopic has really changed the game on how we treat craniopharyngiomas. I, I would say the lion's share of the approaches we do for craniopharyngiomas are largely endoscopic. And I think the major advantage of the endoscope is that it allows us to visualize the undersurface of the chiasm and the hypothalamus, which is an area that's very difficult to see from an approach from above. And so this allows us to do better, more complete uh, removals. This was a young child I treated um, uh, in Mexico City. We did a live surgery course there. and. Um, she had an excellent uh, outcome, has been uh, two to three years recurrence free. But what about these larger tumors, supracellar that's not involving the sphenoid sinus? Can we treat these large cranios endoscopically? And my answer would be yes, as long as they're midline and retrochiasmatic, uh, you can get in there into the retrochiasmatic space. And the major advantage here is to be able to see that interface with the hypothalamus. So I'm going to demonstrate to you a technique I've been using which is a sharp scissor dissection where there's this gelatinous interface on the hypothalamus. And instead of pulling on it, which I think we've done traditionally in the past, if you can see where that interface is, you can use a sharp instrument like scissors or a sharp dissector and really uh, sharply uh, divide that interface and separate the tumor safely from the hypothalamus instead of pulling on it to avoid hypothalamic injury and then remove uh, uh, these large tumors. And so here's the removal of the last portion of it. This has largely been debulked. You can see here's the beautiful view, typical view we see of craniopharyngioma surgery at the, at the end, the Freeman Monroe cerebral aqueduct mm -hmm. and the hypothalamus. So this was a, a complete removal. Here's another case uh, we did recently. You can see it's primarily supra 
diaphragmatic, supracellar. There's no cellar or sphenoid involvement, but you can do these uh, from below and, uh, and get a nice removal. And so this, this was a case I debated long uh, on, on what to do, whether to come from above or below. And in this one, I decided that since the solid component was retrochiasmatic, I felt that uh, coming from below would be uh, more favorable to get better visual outcome. And then perhaps coming second stage from above to get the rest of this. Uh, but what I'll show you is the first stage, which is uh, we're debulking the tumor here from the uh, uh, supracellar component. And then here is the ICA on the left. And so when you're doing craniopharyngioma surgery, we re you really have to understand, but also respect the superior hypophyseal artery. So the superior hypophyseal artery arises from the proximal ICA, and you really have to preserve that artery and follow it back. Don't, uh, don't be fooled thinking it's a tumor feeder and coagulate it because you could uh, lose vision postoperatively. So um, you can see the tumor was wrapping around the, uh, the optic nerve there. And so at this point, I decided, you know, look at the, the tumor adherences uh, uh, to the ACOM complex. At this point, I knew I wasn't going to get a complete removal. So I might as well see if the stock is preservable. So here you can see it. You could, you could preserve the stock. And by, by, preserve, by finding, the way to find the stock is if you lift the tumor up off the gland, look for these portal striations. And if you find these portal striations, there's a stock. There's the basilar complex. And I was able to uh, disconnect the tumor off of the adherence, off the optic nerve, and, and remove the uh, retrochiasmatic portion. This is the rest of the cyst wall. Look how it's stuck to the frontal lobe. It's wrapped around the ACOM complex. And I knew I wasn't going to get a complete removal. So my goal here changed to doing my best maximal safe removal as possible, and then relieving pressure on the optic nerve. And there's the, the fascia lata, and we'll, we'll raise a nasal septal flap and then close the rest with the nasal septal flap. So here's the, uh, here's the post-op scan. And what we found was at three months post-op, the, uh, the cyst shrank. And um, I went ahead and radiated. Instead of coming back second stage, I thought, if I can't, I'm probably not going to get a radical removal out. I'm just going to send for radiation therapy. But look how the tumor cysts have shrunk even further at 16 months. And, and we wrote this up recently on, on using uh, radiation in combination with uh, maximal safe removal. So I'll conclude with these thoughts. Um, the endoscope is, is a great tool in our armamentarium. I think patient selection is important and, and useful, but it may not be the optimal approach. So we have to be tailors and tailor the treatment to our individual patient. And tomorrow I'm gonna touch upon this concept the Bo Jackson concept. We have to have expertise in both open and endoscopic techniques, but sometimes you have to use both approaches in multi cord or surgery. Uh, but in terms of my original concept of, of um, walking the line, I think we can, we can achieve both, which is maximal safe resection and cranial nerve preservation. We have to choose the optimal surgical approach and um, I think it's important to work with a team. I'm blessed that I'm surrounded by a talented team of, of uh, very speci various specialists uh, in our Skull Base Center. And uh, again, I'm very honored to be here and I thank you for your attention.